open up to Jesus himself. And I, I love that. Let's be honest in how we speak to the people about Jesus. Don't do as if you have it all figured out. It's something that we learn at Alpha Course for us as people who help and volunteer. Don't uh, pretend that you are so holy. But also clearly state that you are holy. And that's not because of you, but because of Jesus Christ. He is our message. And so our story points to him and people start to open up. So I'm very happy about those who are in the preacher's team and we have heard from them the last couple of weeks. Today, a message that God put on my heart and uh, we'll see how this will lead us. And I'm reading from 1 Corinthians 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact. Say the fact. Yeah, you say that much better than I. Brothers and sisters, that our ancestors were all under the cloud and that they all passed through the sea. They were all baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink. For they drank from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Okay, if I weren't so familiar with the Bible scriptures, I would say, wait a minute, since when is that a fact that the food the Israelites ate in the desert was actually spiritual food? That's new to me. Okay, okay, the manna, okay. But the water, they drank spiritual drinks. And there was a spiritual rock. And then Paul says, this is a fact. Just in case you wonder sometimes if the Bible made up or not, or people tell you that, the scholar of those days, 2,000 years ago, says, whatever you see written in the Old Testament, that's all facts was no discussion about this. So I had no idea that we can be that bold, like Paul was, and say, you know, all these things in the Old Testament, they're all facts. It all happened. Don't back off, uh, off on that. Don't, don't shy away from that. Don't beat them up if they say no. But be assured. It's a fact. And um, I like how Paul is really leading us onto thin ice with saying all these things that the Israelites um, experienced, especially the provision, was a spiritual thing. <laughs> and that's declared Bible, those writings from Paul. I thought it was just typical kind of food. And how often have we tried to explain those mana flakes in the desert and read up about, oh, it makes total sense. And Paul comes up and saying, yeah, it was all spiritual, that food. Really? We cannot explain spiritual? So... Let that just rest a little as we continue in verse 5. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered in the wilderness. Now, these things occurred as examples. To keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. And he repeats that in verse 11. These things happened to them 
as examples and were written down as warnings for who? For us. On whom the culmination of the ages has come. Here with, we have St. Paul giving us a brief statement in the New Testament on how to deal with the writings of the Old Testament. Which were mostly historic narratives of the nation of Israel. Israel's origin and her development of becoming a nation. All the way to the times of Israel being divided into two nations. The north, still called Israel, and the south, called Judah. And then finally, the whole nation became taken, being taken captive. First the north, and then also some decades later the south. Centerpiece of the writings of the Old Testament was, and is here also in the text, from Paul, the exodus of Israel out of Egypt. And then finally the crossing of the Jordan and the invasion of the promised land, Canaan. Paul refers to these highlights of the nation of Israel when starting this chapter 10 in his first letter to the Christian in Corinth. Uh, even though we know that probably there was not chapter and verse count in his first letters. But it helps us to find this stuff, right? And to read along. So he writes, All the people of God were baptized into Moses and the cloud of God. And the Red Sea. He symbolized for us as being their baptism. The Red Sea and the cloud being their baptism. But the walk of the first generation of believers through the wilderness, did not have a happy end because of their lack of trust in God. Or should we say, their lack of obedience toward God and His leading. I guess we could say, disobedience and distrust become synonyms here, at least for Israel. And so the first generation had the desert as their grave. And only the next generation arrived in the land and managed to possess what had been promised already to their parent generation. Here Paul concludes and then even repeats it again when mentioning these historic moments. Now all these things occurred as examples. These things happened to them as examples written down as a warning for us. In other words, God wants us who are believers today under the new covenant in Jesus, He wants us to learn from the Old Testament nation Israel. And when they were on their way to becoming a nation, through testing and trials, making sure that they would be fit to be a nation of God, but then failing in the process. And uh, even though we don't like that so much, and I kind of try to avoid saying it, but it is written as a warning, not as an encouragement. Because, you know, all what we, even as Christian church people today, allow to our hearts and ears is encouragement. We don't like warnings anymore. Get lost with your warnings. And if I go to hell, I don't care. But don't warn me. I'm free. I can do whatever I want. But don't warn me. But here is a warning from Paul. And I'm just quoting him. He says, these are all written down so that you will not 
start doing evil as they did. Dying in the desert, not arriving in the promised land. Warning! Whoa, 2017, are you kidding me? Well, it's up to us if we want to be Christians or if we want to be just a little, you know, like according to what I think Christianity means is that we still have the Bible as our book. I'm, I'm not sure if that is still valid or not. But I suggest we do. Otherwise, why don't we just have a good life? And not care about Whatever is written in here. If we don't believe in the Bible anyways anymore, just let's do what we want to do. But the Bible is very clear. And you know, sometimes God is also, sorry to say that, but I would say it in my words, twisting our arm. If you don't do that, you won't get that. Well, who is he? I'm an adult. I'm not a child anymore. But he's not, he's not even holding back talking to us like that in the New Testament. Well, that's not how you can communicate to the people. That's what you say. You don't know. And these warnings, of course, have also a good news side of it. Hear these writings to be aware of the fact, like it or not, I have to learn that too, we are not better than the Israelites. We are out of the same stuff. And whoever thinks he or she stands. Be careful that you do not fall. We are not better than the Israelites. Our tendencies, our habits, our longings, our cravings, our character, our personalities, they might vary a little. But at the end of the day, we are also flesh and blood like they were. And so it's good to see and not to think, oh, it's totally different now. It's not. The good thing is, again, the good news. Today, we have a Savior. Today, we have someone who can forgive us and cleanse us and bring us back on track. But that's only possible if we know that we are wrong. If you think we are right... What's the use of being led back to the right track if we're already right? So it's good to once in a while look at this and say, you know what? Hmm, I would probably would have rebelled, rebelled with the Israelites. I have all my um, people who kind of like know English, like all in my focus. Poor Germans. They will deal with me now. You know, I, I wrote, okay, so as you know, Liz and I were preparing for Germany. I know, sorry to rub it in, but uh, it's not to hurt you just to have you as partner with us, praying for us and seeing good things happening because this call is really birthed out of this church ministry because I have completely, had completely given up everything what attached me to Germany in the past. And then God started calling me again 2011 and stirring me up and saying, I need you to go to Germany. I talked to the board about that at that time. Is I need to go to Germany. And they said, what, what do you want to do there? And there's a city that doesn't have a church. I would just want to pray. I just want to walk through it and pray. And they let me, kind of thought I need, need a break maybe or something. Actually, they started praying for me too, started believing in it. And within a one and a half year 
period a church started in that city, after not having a church for decades, a church that within one and a half years after praying, birthed out of this church and asked them, they say, Marcus, was so good that you were sent and praying there that really get, got, got us to start a church here. And the guy who started the church is now in charge of the whole center of Germany to do church planting from that little church. They only have 25 people there, but they have already planted another church in the east, in the former communism part. And they're from there, from that little city where we prayed seven years ago, six years ago, they're directing all the church plants in the center of Germany that will start. And now we're moving in there and helping them from the part that we are sent um, in that location at approximately one and a half hours away from there. And they're already saying, come, <laughs> we're looking forward to working together. Prayer can change a lot of things. And so these Germans, um, they got from me a German promotional, kind of introducing the ministry, introducing, introducing the ministry, ministry, there you go, I'm thinking German now for a moment, and I'm writing a wonderful, I think it was like really good German question and answer sheet, right, send it over to my friend in um, Bodensee. Uh, down in the south coast of Switzerland, and he was looking over it and said, yeah, it's really nice. Marcus, um, before you send that out, let a German read this, please, and correct it. My wife said it was very good. Come on. A, if she says it good, it is good. <laughs> um, do I have a lot of English grammar in there? Well, whatever you do, it's just not German anymore. <laughs> Get that. Okay, so we're, we're working on the language issue, right? So... Sometimes we just don't understand anymore what's written in here. It's just so lost. It just doesn't fit our frame anymore. But God is calling us to seek Him a little more. And you will find something also even today in this message It is actually true that with your natural understanding, even if we change all the wordings in today's, into today's language, you will not really understand it. Maybe from your natural senses here you will kind of get it. But what God really, and it is a letter from God to men, really wants to say to us, it will still be hidden from you if you do not seek for the Holy Spirit of God to reveal it to you. It will be still hidden from you. You know it all, but you don't, not, you don't know anything. How do you explain all these words? How do you explain that it says spiritual if it was natural? to them? That actually was good to their bodies and nourished them 40 years. How can spiritual food do that? Spiritual food is just for the head and the heart, but not for the stomach. That's what you think. Because the one who created everything writes in his letter, this is just a reflection of the real unseen creation that your eyes cannot see. This is just a bit turning into dust. But the real picture is a spiritual one and you will not see it with your natural eyes. And it is therefore extensively more beautiful than what you see here now. Spiritual. It's a different language. It's a different way of 
understanding. So these Old Testament scriptures are examples, are parables, and we read them, and I read them as, as, as a teacher of the word. I see examples and parables bursting out of the scripture in many details and also as a whole. When looking at them closely, we will discover one lesson after the other for our lives as Christians, as a church, as one church as a community of believers. I would like to take a little time walking with you through these years, these decades of Israel's past from Egypt to the promised land and see what we can take home for us as lessons, even as warnings, as we said. Today, however, I want to focus in on Moses and to some extent use him as an example for us, Emmanuel Pentecostal Church and our calling in this world. Looking at Moses' life and his biography of this leader of God, we can learn a lot and take him as example. He is the savior of Egypt. You might not like that term, but that's how he was called in the Bible. Moses was the savior of the people that were slaves in Egypt, to correct my first sentence there. Of the lost in Egypt. Giving the, these falling thoughts a title, I would call it, let's understand that we are a church like Moses. A church like Moses. Huh? How can a church be like one person? Paul says it in 1 Corinthians 12. He says that all these members of the body, that church that we are, all these different members work together in synergy as if it is one body. So yes, we can take Moses, this one person, as an example for us as a church. We as a church, as a community of believers, should work all together with our gifts and efforts, different characters and personalities, as if we are one person. And I think that is a very challenging assignment. And I would say, in the natural, it is actually impossible. But for God, nothing is impossible. A church like Moses. Moses had a calling in his heart. A calling that he was not really aware of when growing up. This name Moses means to pull out or draw out in brackets of water. And he got this name from the, the princess of Egypt. Pharaoh's daughter. Because she pulled Moses out of the water. And she probably had no idea how significant this name was. Because that would be the purpose of his life. And it would take him a very, very long time to finally get there. To live out this purpose that was given to him already with birth. Drawn out of water. How would he know that he one day would be God's savior Pulling a whole nation out of the water. Out of the Red Sea. A savior. Moses. God's arm. A long, long journey. Still until that finally happened. When looking at his life while growing up as a prince of Egypt, it seems that he must have had something like a burning within himself. Because he, beca he became, so it seems, more and more passionate about the people of Israel. Who were slaves to his stepdad, the Pharaoh. And the people of Egypt, that means the Israelites were subject also to Moses. He was already the boss of the Israelites. Did you know that? He was already the prince over the Israelites when growing up. But that was only in the natural sense. It just 
did not give him rest. He was restless. He was advocating for the Israelites. So much so that by killing this God who beat up one of the Israelites, one of the slaves, which is a normal thing, that cost him everything. He lost it all. The comfort zone. The, the, the place called home. And he lost the roots. Even that had started to grow to, towards Israel with his, his foster family that actually was his real family. He ran off. Forty years doing a good thing. Helping his father-in-law, caring for the sheep. Until one day, God called him back. And what he wanted to do with his own strength, in his own way of pushing things the way he always was successful in. And he learned it from his dad, the stepdad, Pharaoh. God called him now to do in God's ways. He had a burning bush experience. We often, in the past, last Sunday, maybe today, that depends on how you experience our services, have burning bush experiences. Where it's like, holy. You're like, if you knew about that term, so I could take off my shoes now, you know? Like, I mean, not disturbing the holiness, right? <laughs> With the smell or something. But, uh, like, just this is holy ground right now, right? This is, God is really here. But that is not the calling. That is just the time when God starts to call and get the awareness of the one who needs to be called. Our moments with God, our burning bush moments, are only there so God has our attention to tell us something. Now I need you to go. And he had objectives like we all do. Oh, wait a minute. How can you call me now? They don't even know who you are. And I thought about that and I thought, you know, this is what people without God often tell us. And we fear that they do. Maybe they don't even do that. But we fear and we tell God, if I tell them about you, what should I tell them? Who you are. What kind of God are you? Just tell them that I am God. I am I am the creator. Just tell them, I am. You, you know God. And if they ask which kind of God, you say, I know the one God. And we think that's not enough. Moses thought that's not enough. And then we tell them, tell the Lord that we're not capable of doing that. Even though we were trying 40 years ago with all our might. And had good techniques to advocate for the lost in the world. We just push it through. We just make a way in our human strength so that they start coming. One person told me, take another two minutes. Told me when we started church planting in East Germany. Just do whatever you can to get those people here. This is my good mentor advice to you. And I said, what, what do I do when they're here? When I call them out of their lifestyle that they lived before. And they come on a Sunday and they come all here. And we're all happy. What do I do with them on Monday? And on Tuesday? Because one thing I know. They will not be back next Sunday. If I just in my own smartness. In the way I can trick people or influence people and get them to come, will get them to come. Nobody will ever guarantee me that they will come back next Sunday. 
unless I'm open and willing to be in there 100% all the way. And I, like Moses, say, I tried this and I failed and I will not try this again. I'm done with that. We are not a church that can save the lost. It's just the way it is. We tried. Moses said, I tried. And then he said, pardon me, Lord. Pardon me, Lord. That's nice. I think that's very polite. He actually said, pardon me, Lord. But I cannot speak. You know that one? I know that for myself. I cannot speak. I just demonstrated that to you. Why would I, with my California accent, would try to get the people to believe in God? How will they ever believe me? And I heard it here in this church too. Our English is so bad. We cannot ask people to follow Jesus. It's so bad. We cannot pray out loud in the church. That, our, our language is so bad. A church, just like Moses. It's okay. Just like Moses. You know what happened? God told them, I have a sign for you. And I say that to Emmanuel too, I have a sign for you. He said to him, one day you will stand here with this nation and praise me. That's my sign to you. And I tell you, Emmanuel, even you, you think, and some of you do, this church will not save the lost in this generation anymore. It will die out. You know what? Don't underestimate the power of God. Don't underestimate what he can do to convince people that he is alive. And that he is able to save the lost. And they pulled them out of the water. And they were standing in front of the Lord. And they were praising him. And that was the sign. Israel had their sign. Moses had his sign. Emmanuel, let's pray for the sign. Let's keep our eyes up high, not too low, and thinking we cannot do it. There's a sign God is giving you. One day this house will be filled to the brim. And you will have several services to capture the people that you try to save and pull out of the water. And that will be your sign. And I say that in a prophetic way. This will be your sign. And I believe, it's up to you, but I believe God is still alive. And we do believe that. And Lord, we dedicate ourselves to you. We are not more like than a, a Moses. We have tried and we have failed. We have done a lot of things and we were uprooted. But now we're standing here and you're calling us, Lord. And it is hard for us to really grab, grasp this, this calling. And we ask you to help us. Pick us up, Lord. Push us in the right direction. Strengthen us, Lord, even with the help of an errand, Lord. And give us the guts like you did for Moses when you stood in front of the Pharaoh and dared him and stood and advocated for the lost. One day we will fight with the devil for the lost souls in the name of Jesus. And our faith will be the victory. Because we believe that Jesus already has won the victory for those who are lost. And Lord, I, I ask that you fulfill your promises to your church. And all of us who are here today, help us not to doubt, but to belong. And to trust and walk this walk until we see unfold what you have promised. In Jesus' name. Everyone says, Amen. God bless you. This Sunday, um, I encourage you strongly, pray for Alpha Course. There are people who said that they would show up. 
friend of mine who have not who has not been in church for a long time and he said he would be there tonight and you know what can happen let's fight for the soul fight for the souls that are lost in your family in Jesus name and that is at five o'clock tonight alpha course would be great to see you there otherwise we see you next Sunday God bless <laughs>